Hi, I'm Eric Pistowski, and welcome to another episode of EP on EP. It's an absolute delight to have my guest today, Dr. Uh, Jeannie Poole, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. Welcome to the show, Jeannie. Thank you. So I was trying to figure out what would be the best thing to do you, with our, our interview today. And you've been involved in so many types of trials, but you've really had a major interest in sudden cardiac death. And rather than review all the trials you've been involved in, from your perspective now, let's just have a conversation on where do you think we should be headed? I mean, what kind of trials? I'm sure you've given a lot of thought, so why don't you start? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. I think we're really at an inflection point um, with prevention of sudden death. We have all the old trials. Most of us know them very well. They're critical. They still inform the guidelines. And the guidelines haven't really changed much. We, we have Danish. Danish was a disruptive trial, but really we need to now take it beyond that. And we need to take it beyond that because so much has changed. When you think about the fact that you know, 2005 was when Scud Heft was published. That's when the NCD was really, you know, determined and guidelines. And not a lot has changed since mm -hmm. that time in terms of, you know, the indications for devices. But a lot has changed in terms of patients and patient care. And, you know, what we're um, looking at in, in heart failure patients. So if you look at, for instance, the um, paradigm heart failure trial, and Tresto, and the reduction in sudden cardiac death just due to a good heart failure medication. You now add SGLT2 inhibitors on. Um, you know, we have reductions that are at least about 60% in sudden cardiac death just from heart failure medications. Mm -hmm. And the reduction in sudden cardiac death by the ICD in both companion, scud have to made it was 60%. Now, so what we have to do is figure out what's on top of that. Okay. So how can we make that be more than that 60%? So we have some risk prediction models. So we can look at the Seattle Proportional Heart Risk Model. We can look at what Christine Albert's doing with her group and you know, predetermine to try to identify those patients at risk. Okay. So this is what's really different from when all of those classical trials were done. So we weren't really, I mean, the event rates were so high back then, right? I mean, people had high event rates, rates, mortality rates, they had high sudden death rates. It's really changed. Right. So, and we also cannot lump everybody together. That's another real issue that we have to think about as we go forward in trials. We've got ischemics, mm -hmm. they're still at high risk. They are a group of patients that are likely to continue to benefit from ICD therapy, but the non-ischemics isn't just one group called non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Right. It's this whole, you know, heterogeneous population all of them with different sudden cardiac death risks. So how are we going to design trials for that? So let us let me pick this apart now yep. and have you just respond to it. So let's start with the newer agents. I've heard a lot of people opine that uh, guideline therapy now should include things like, you know, Entresto, SGLT2 inhibitors. That's fine, except there, there are no data, right, to say you have to do that. And I'm a bit conflicted myself on what to do. I mean, uh, do you think we need another trial? It seems impossible someone's going to do that trial, right? But <coughs> what, what do you think is the right thing to do now? Well, I mean, the new heart failure, updated heart failure guidelines definitely support using those medications. So, I mean, it's an important question because now if we are going to expect those patients to be on all of those medications, right. we better have some, you know, good tri further trials. We need, we need more trials to support exactly. this update to the heart failure guidelines. I'm concerned about, you know, how do we go forward designing the next, you know, Danish or the, or the next whatever, Scud have, you know, two <laughs> right. trial in the setting of all of these medications. Do you demand that all patients be on you know, quadruple heart failure therapy, is that what's going to be optimal medical therapy? Um, what about HEFPEF? You know, what right. do we do with those patients where there's even less uh, medical therapy? So this is what I mean. I think we're really at this inflection point where everything's changing so fast. The heart failure medications are changing. Our understanding of heart failure is changing. And where, where do we do, so, uh, where do we put ICDs right, in the so middle of that? So let me even be more controversial. Mm, okay, uh, great. Not that I'm ever controversial. No, never. You. Uh, <laughs> I... It, I am convinced that we've been chasing, chasing this, the, the wrong guy, this EF. And, you know, oh, and, and everybody kind of gives lip service to that. It's not the only thing. But the data on fibrosis are very strong in multiple disease states. So personally, I'm more worried about a person with an EF of 45% uh, that has scar than 30% with no scar. So 
should we be doing those trials? Should well, we we're doing it. I mean, I'm not doing it, but you know, the CMR guide trial is, yeah. is you know, a randomized trial that's that's looking at you know LG and the randomizing patients who currently don't fit the clinical guidelines to an implantable loop recorder versus a device. So, I mean, we've got some of these trials going on. I think that the real issue is, does SCAR predict all-cause mortality versus does it predict ventricular arrhythmias at proportional levels that we can figure out who needs the ICD? We know from individual trials, the SCAR is associated with ventricular arrhythmias. We already know that. Mm -hmm. But we still, we still have to find that patient population within all of that that have a relatively low all-cause mortality and a really high risk of sudden cardiac arrest. Maybe, you know, LGE will tell us that, but it's not going to be presence of yes or no. It's going to be the pattern of the L LGE, how many places, you mm -hmm. know, the myocardium are affected, and hopefully out of that we can take um, LG and put that together with known clinical risk factors to start identifying pa appropriate patient groups. But, but like I said, being controversial, for me, when I'm seeing a patient sent to me who meets non-ischemic, you know, uh, uh, criteria for an ICD because of EF, even though they've had guideline therapy, if they have no scar, that's part of my discussion now. I don't say no, but I tell them I think they're at low risk because there are plenty of data to support that. So I guess my yeah. point is, um, does it matter if you're on Entresto, okay? I don't know if that's the mm. key. That's gonna make your EF better and your heart failure better, that it doesn't necessarily mean your risk of sudden death in that particular patient that has scar. And we don't know, right? We, we don't, don't know. know. That's the problem. Right. The other problem, well, there's two two points. I mean, one, if it's a sarcoid patient, we now do have support to implant an ICD yes. despite LVEF. So that's right. an example of a disease process based upon utilization of scar. Right. Right. I mean, that, that's right. what that is. So we, we know that we have a you know, example disease and whether or not we can roll that out to other forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, I agree with you. A lot of scar really worries me. But what do you do if you've got a patient with, you know, 45% left ventricular ejection fraction and a scar? How are you going to then go about putting an ICD in them and get it paid for. You can take them to the lab. Right. Right, you can go to the lab. And, and try to start something. Go old school, but not <laughs> right. just old school, it's new school. The Australians are doing that, right? right. They've resurrected doing EP studies. Yes. So you, you can do you that. You can do that, right. But how I, else oh, are you, I agree. How I, are you know, gonna get the, that uh, There's paid a difference for? of what my current thinking is versus reality <laughs> what I could do, Jeannie. No, I'm just saying in the discussion of trials in the yeah. future, uh, I think that's key, and I think I'd rather chase the SCAR than the EF is what I'm oh, saying. Oh, me too, absolutely, I agree. both of us have been involved in all those trials where you have so many patients with a low EF, and you put an ICD and nothing ever happens, and if you went back now, I bet most of them had yeah. mi no or minimal scar. I mean, e even in the Scott Heft era, you know, over the course of five years, 80% of the patients never used their device. Right, that's the So, my, so yeah. we know we know that LVEF cutoff is is not right. helpful. We know that New York Heart Association class is even fraught with error because right. it's subjective. And right. I don't know what that means today to be able to compare to what it meant yeah. in the past. So we have all of these questions that need to be I answered. Agree. So many questions. So many questions. So one last so thing. So little time. It's so little time, right. <laughs> so, um, the other thing that really bothers me is mitral valve prolapse. Oh, me too. Uh, okay, so um, when you have a boutique disease like that, I mean, no, how do we study it from a trial standpoint? I mean, we didn't ever really study Brugada because it's really hard, right, to study boutique diseases where you don't have huge numbers. And But I'm very worried about that subgroup, the, the arrhythmogenic group. Me with, too. So what, what are you doing with that patient now? I, I worry about them. I have nightmares over those yeah, patients. Yeah, it's worrisome. I mean, you know, we. I mean, we've been around a while, you and I, and I mean, I can remember those patients way back when being really, really worried about them. Um, you know, we need to have a um, multi-center, you know, really well-described prospective registries. I, I, you can't do a randomized clinical right. trial. We need to randomize clinical trials for accessory pathways, yes. right? I mean, we knew that it worked and we followed people and it got adopted. And I, right. think, I think you're right. I think these boutique things are going to be dependent upon prospective registries. So those patients are at very high risk, you know, annular disjunction and the right. patients who are having... And that's, and that's even the worst, right? Yes. Because we have at least some clues on what to do with the high-risk patient with by bi leaflet my prolapse, the scar, T-wave inversions, but this MAD stuff. Yeah, is it's 
you can have it without the prolapse, I know. right? And it's like, I know it's a risk factor, but I have no idea what to do with it. No, I, I know exactly. I mean, I, I, I literally lose sleep over those patients and find any reason to get an ICD in them. Yeah, because <laughs> really, often they have good hearts, right? And, and it's a tragedy when they, when they pass away. Thank you for your insights. It's always wonderful. It's great to see you. Take Lovely. care. Thank you.